Hello everyone. Tonight, we're going to explore a mysterious continent, but one we all visit regularly. The world of sleep and dreams. I'll tell you about what happens when we sleep, what happens in our brains, in the rest of our bodies, and also in our minds. We will explore the concept of consciousness and intermediary states like lucid dreaming or sleepwalking. I will tell you about dreams and the different angles, neurobiology, psychiatry and psychology, and also culture. As a part of the human experience, dreams have acquired different meanings along history and in the arts. So I'll tell you about how men have approached sleep and dreams, the scientific study of sleep and the biology of it is still a recent way of looking at this phenomenon. Prior to that, there was a wealth of hypotheses, beliefs and myths around sleep. So we have a lot of things to explore tonight. And it is a bit meta because this story is also intended to help you fall asleep if you wish to. So, if you fall asleep during the story, or if you wish to navigate it, it is cut into chapters, timestamps, that you will find in the first command pinned under the video. And speaking of sleep, for tonight's video I have partnered again with Slumber, the sleep and relaxation app. They have many of my stories on the app, together with hundreds of other bedtime stories, atmospheric soothing sounds, or sleep meditations. They add more every week. One thing I appreciate is how easy it is to use and to customize the experience you want. You can add different background sound effects to any story be it train sounds, snow, a river, or even crickets. We have agreed on an extended free trial for my subscribers, 30 days instead of 7, that you can access via the link in the description. If you decide to keep it after the first free month, it costs a bit more than $3 a month with the yearly subscription. And the app is now available for Android in the Google Play Store too. It was only just released for Android, so some of the more sophisticated features of the iOS version aren't available for Android yet, but they will be rolling out soon. So don't hesitate to give it a try if you want to. And now, as we are about to begin our exploration journey, I invite you to sit or lie down comfortably, to let the tension go, especially in your shoulders. You may close your eyes at any time, since you won't need any visuals to follow along. And now, let's start. You may not be asleep as you listen to this, but you are somewhere in a cycle that inevitably will evolve into a sleep phase later, maybe in minutes, maybe in several hours. Even though this cycle is disrupted for many of us, or even though you often have trouble sleeping. Many people have a hard time finding sleep 
during the hours that should be dedicated to it. It may be occasional, because of worries or external stimuli that keep them alert, or it can be chronic for physiological or psychological reasons. But however hard it is, ultimately you will find sleep and you will get rest from it. Sooner or later, and without thinking about it, you will drift to a state of drowsiness, of somnolence, and you will transition from wakefulness into sleep. Sleep onset happens when some of the cells in our brains, some of the neurons that are silent when we are awake, become active. They release specific neurotransmitters which are chemical compounds, chemical messengers that transmit messages between cells of our nervous system and to other cells of our bodies. More than 200 different of these neurotransmitters have been identified. There may be more, and they all have a role to play in the processes that keep us alive give us control over our bodies and also manage our transitions from awake to asleep. But despite the alteration of our conscience when we sleep, our bodies keep working. We breathe, our hearts beat, and a lot of things happen inside that we're going to talk about later. First, let's take a look at the various states or the various phases we experience when we fall asleep. A nap or a night's sleep may feel like an interrupter has been switched. And when you wake up, time has passed like in an instant. But in fact, a lot has happened. First, after sleep onset, we fall in a state called quiescent sleep, or non-rapid eye movement sleep, because we will see later that after quiescent sleep comes another phase of rapid eye movement when our eyes move quickly under our lids. It is possible to track what happens in the brain with electroencephalography, electrodes placed on someone's head to record electrical activity in the brain. This method obviously doesn't give a detailed understanding or insight on what happens in the brain. It is just about measuring signals produced by its activity. But electroencephalography or EEG very clearly shows the different stages through which the sleeper goes. Electrical activity gives different waves, different wavelengths. In the first stage of quiescent sleep, which is a transition, a kind of relaxed wakefulness, waves measured by EEG change, reflecting the passage from one state of consciousness to another. But still, it is easy to get out of this transition phase if there is an external stimulus like noise, or sometimes even without a stimulus. Maybe sometimes you have experienced a sudden contraction of the muscles in a limb that made you jump and suddenly awaken for a moment. This is called a hypnic jerk, and it is quite common, totally involuntary. It takes you out of this first phase, but generally it is followed by a quick return to sleep onset. The first stage of quiescent sleep is 
quite short, a few minutes at most, because it evolves towards a second phase of light sleep. We know it is a second phase because EEG changes again, and it now tends to show short characteristic bursts of neural activity. They are called sleep spindles, and they alternate with long waves called K-complexes. At this point, the meaning of these signals is largely unknown. Their origins inside the brain has been found, but their function is still a mystery. This illustrates how much we still ignore about the human brain. A lot of progress has been made in the past few decades thanks to methods like EEG and medical imaging. The brain has been mapped and examined under multiple angles. Its biochemistry is better understood. But many questions remain about why it works like it does and the relationships between signals that are measured in the brain and our states of consciousness or our control over our bodies. Stage 2 of quiescent sleep is sometimes called light sleep because the sleeper can easily be awakened. There is still a degree of alertness in case something happens around him. This alertness and the EEG signals associated with stage 2 are going to change again as the sleeper enters stage 3, or deep sleep. It is also called slow wave sleep because the EEG activity shows synchronized and slow waves of a relatively high amplitude. Certain zones of the brain that are active when we are awake and keep working during the previous stages can finally begin to rest. At least this is what their electric activity suggests. There has been studies of sleep deprivation with humans that indicate that the primary function of deep sleep may be to allow the brain to recover from its daily activities and also to consolidate memory. Memory is an entirely different topic that maybe I will tell you about in another story. But as you probably know, we forget a lot of what we do. There are many memories that may be hard to access when we want to, but they are there, and eventually we will remember. These ones have actually been stored, but there are also many potential memories that our brains decide to get rid of, because they are considered not memorable enough, unimportant, and these ones are erased forever. This includes things you did yesterday or two days ago, and you may be under the impression that you can actually remember your day quite precisely. Maybe you can, but there are still plenty of details that have already gone. More will go after several more nights and it probably happens for a reason. As living beings, we need to organize and somehow rank our memories by importance or by category. Shedding the ones that are not particularly relevant may actually be useful for us to function. This process is not totally independent from our will. If you decide to remember a detail and make a conscious effort to remember it, you are much more likely to remember. The vast majority of these memories that get erased are routine tasks. For example, you 
probably made tea or coffee or brushed your teeth thousands of times in your life. If you try, you can certainly remember several occurrences of these, but certainly not all of them, because they are gone. Deep sleep also affects other functions, like the secretion of growth hormone. Growth hormone plays an important role for children and teenagers. It stimulates human bodily development, but we produce it all along our lives. It accelerates cell reproduction and cell regeneration. The production of growth hormone reaches its peak during stage 3, during deep sleep. So as you see, there are several aspects of deep sleep associated with restoration of our bodies. And beyond that, the structure or the functioning of our conscious minds for when we are awake. Stage 3 is considered uh, the deepest stage of sleep, based on how far it is from our awake state in terms of sensitivity to external stimuli. Historically, a distinction was made between a phase 3 and a phase 4. Phase 4 being deep sleep, and phase 3 the transition to it. But nowadays they are generally merged into a single phase because the EEG measurements are very close. But this is not the end of the sleep cycle yet. Because after the various stages of quiescent sleep or non-rapid eye movement sleep, the sleeper is now going to enter a very different phase, rapid eye movement or paradoxical sleep. The whole sequence with the stages of quiescent sleep and paradoxical sleep does not encompass an entire night's sleep. It varies, but in average, the whole cycle, three stages of quiescent sleep and paradoxical sleep, this lasts around 90 minutes. So in an entire night's sleep, there are three to six of these cycles. Even though we often don't remember it, it is common to wake up briefly between the cycles. Maybe you are used to wake up, change position and go back to sleep during the night. Chances are these awakenings happen when you exit paradoxical sleep and you restart another cycle when you go back to sleep. You may also have noticed that these moments when you briefly wake up are moments when you realize you just had a dream. This is not surprising, because paradoxical sleep, when our eyes are moving rapidly out of our control, we don't realize it. This is the moment when dreams are the most vivid and abundant. I will tell you later about dreams. For now, let's take a look at what paradoxical sleep is. As I told you before, this phase is also called rapid eye movement or REM sleep, because it was its most obvious characteristic when it was singled out, discovered in the 1950s. But its effects extend to the rest of the body and the brain. Once again, the abundance or absence of certain neurotransmitters changes during this phase. One characteristic of paradoxical sleep is the abundance in the brain of acetylcholine, one of these neurotransmitters. The transition to REM brings marked physical changes. The body, since the beginning of the sleep cycle, maintained very steady conditions of temperature, breathing and 
blood circulation, all of these were stable. In REM, large fluctuations in these functions appear. The rhythm of breathing may vary, the heart may accelerate, and body temperature may rise or decrease. Under these aspects, REM sleep restores some of the functions of the awakened state, but we are still sleeping and unable to notice it. On the other hand, muscle tone suddenly disappears. A neural short circuit eliminates strength in all muscles except for necessary functions like the heart or the lungs. This means that the sleeper can no longer move. Motor neurons are completely inhibited. It is a form of paralysis, but one that has its advantages, its usefulness, because vivid dreams accompany this phase. And without it, without the paralysis, sleepers could move a lot, unaware that they are in a dream. It has also been observed that the use of energy in the brain, measured by the metabolism of oxygen and glucose, rises a lot during REM sleep. It becomes similar or even exceeds the energy consumed in waking. This is why REM sleep is called paradoxical sleep. It is paradoxical in the sense that the body and the brain are on energy consumption levels similar to wakefulness, despite the body paralysis. There is no reason to be anxious about this paralysis. As soon as we wake up, the inhibition of motor neurons ends, and we retake control. But there is a state called sleep paralysis, that happens when people fall asleep or when they wake up, in which the person is aware but unable to move or speak. These episodes may come with hallucinations of being touched or hearing something and induce a lot of anxiety because the hallucinations feel perfectly real. It is not uncommon it is estimated that up to 50% of people may experience sleep paralysis at least once in their lifetimes. And about 5% of people have regular episodes. It is believed that the mechanism involves a dysfunction in paradoxical sleep. Somehow the return to normal motor functions is delayed creating a sensation of being trapped inside one's body. Skeptics believe this could be an explanation for some stories of paranormal events, like alien abductions. People would be absolutely sincere, because they were indeed not dreaming, but hallucinating while awake, which is a very different experience. And at the same time, they were paralyzed. Maybe if it happens to you one day, the best thing to do is realize that this is rare but not uncommon, and that you are not fully paralyzed. The fact that you are awake and conscious, this means that your heart is beating, you are breathing, and at most this can last a couple of minutes. So you're going to be all right. During a night with several sleep cycles, as I said before, they last around 90 minutes. There are several episodes, several phases of REM sleep. And as the cycles pass, they tend to last longer. When the phases of sleep are measured by EEG, for an average sleeper over a night of 6 to 8 hours, the cycles change. Successive quiescent sleep phases tend to be shorter and less deep 
measured by the duration of slow-wave sleep. On the other hand, paradoxical sleep lasts longer and is more likely to end in an awakening. So why is there this phase of REM sleep? What is its function, given that the brain and the body don't seem to rest during it? And why do eyes move during this phase? The possible explanation is that the eye movements relate to the sense of vision experienced in a dream. But this explanation is not fully satisfactory because it has been observed that people who were born blind still move their eyes in a REM sleep, even though they typically do not have visual imagery in their dreams. Another hypothesis explaining eye movement is that it would be only a side effect of the brain processing memory, but this is not explained at this point. Despite the higher energy consumption and activity in the brain and the body too during paradoxical sleep, it seems to be biologically necessary. For experiments, People have been deprived of REM sleep. The phases of their sleep were monitored by EEG and they were woken up every time REM sleep began. When the experiment ended and they could sleep without interruption, they had longer REM sleep phases, as if they were catching up and REM sleep deprivation has been associated with a state of irritability and anxiety, with difficulties to uh, stay focused too. So biologically and psychologically, REM sleep is important, but it is unknown why and how. There are various hypotheses about it. It could be important for the preservation of certain types of memories related to space or emotions. For example, it has been observed on rats that REM sleep tends to last longer following intensive learning sessions, as if they needed to process the acquired knowledge. But on the other hand, Studies on a few rare individuals that are chronically deprived of REM sleep because of injuries to their brains that didn't let them enter this phase or stay in it. This showed that their memory was not significantly affected in the long term. Another theory is that REM sleep acts like a neural simulation it would create and maintain neural connections in the brain. An element in favor of this idea is that REM sleep prevails most just after birth, and then it diminishes with age. For newborns, it could aid the developing brain to form connections. Yet other theories connected to evolution it could be a transformation that happened millions of years ago of a well-known defensive mechanism called the tonic immobility reflex. You know that a variety of animals can feign death. It is their last line of defense in front of a predator. Their bodies suddenly become immobilized and stiff which makes them appear dead. Of course, humans and many other animals with a complex nervous system cannot do that. But there is a number of similarities between their REM sleep and tonic immobility. Paralysis, changes in temperature and activity in the same zones of the brain. REM sleep could be an evolution that we inherited from ancient life forms, but that no longer serves as a defense mechanism. Still related to evolution or self-defense, 
REM sleep could be a process to reactivate animals and human beings periodically, to scan their environment for possible predators. I told you earlier that it often ended in a brief awakening before a new sleep cycle begins. This doesn't explain the muscle paralysis, and it seems contradictory if they are to escape a predator. But maybe this paralysis would be to ensure that the animal doesn't move and attract attention involuntarily before it is fully awake. That's possible, but the truth is we don't exactly know why this REM sleep phase exists and what purposes it has, if any. But the most notable aspect of this phase for us is the intensity of dreaming. So, let's talk about dreams. Dreams do not only happen during paradoxical sleep. There can be some before, during the phases of quiescent sleep, but not as many and not as vivid. We are also much more likely to remember REM dreams because we typically wake up briefly after this phase. Dreams are not that easy to define. We all know what they are about because they manifest themselves as stories or at least a succession of images, ideas, emotions and sensations that occur in the mind. But are these sensations, these images, the dream itself, or a side effect of something else? They are also deeply personal and connected to our lives. We dream with elements we know, or that we seem to create based on things we know. But it is hard to retell a dream as if it was a, a movie or a story that we just watched. They are also full of emotions. We seem to be thinking in them, and most of the time we are not aware that we dream when we dream. It is only when we remember a dream that we put it at a distance and can rethink of it as a third person. I said most of the time because there are lucid dreams too. I tell you about that later. There are different ways of looking at dreams and they all have interesting observations to bring. They can be approached by neurobiology, what happens physically and measurably when someone is dreaming. They can be approached by a psychology and psychiatry too, focusing more on the content of dreams, their context and possible meaning and function. Or maybe not everything has a meaning and they could be the product of random brain activation that our minds process to give them an apparent logic or signification. And is also a cultural approach to dreams. They are part of the human experience, and since ancient history they have been attributed a wide range of functions and meanings. When it comes to biology and neurosciences first, we have seen that the various phases of sleep were piloted from the brain and that, depending on the phases, the active regions of the brain and the types of neurotransmitters were very different. So, one of the central questions of sleep research is what part of the brain drives the dream experience. When we are awake, most of the internal imagery in our minds that helps us reason, plan and strategize for every action is controlled from the front of the brain. 
a region called the, the lateral prefrontal cortex. This part of the brain acts like a puppeteer or a processor, assembling objects stored in memory into combinations. But during the most dream-intensive phase of sleep, in REM sleep, the lateral prefrontal cortex is inactive. And it seems this region of the brain is irrelevant to dreams. Because for people who suffered brain damage there, dreams do not change at all. It isn't clear how images or sensations appear in one's perception during REM sleep, and from which part of the brain. It could be that other regions of the brain, other than the prefrontal cortex, take over. They do the job of trying to elaborate a coherent imagery. But because it is not their primary function, and they are not the usual processes of reasoning and strategizing, they would make different associations that would give dreams this sometimes unreal or illogical aspect. However, dreams are not floating in the mind, separated from matter. Dreams can be inhibited physically by blocking a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And conversely, an increase in dopamine stimulates very vivid dreams and nightmares too. Biologically, a nightmare or a bad dream is not a specific phenomenon. It is just a particularly vivid dream that can cause a strong emotional response of fear, sadness or anxiety. Apart from psychological causes that dominate when people have recurrent nightmares, they can also have physical factors that trigger or favor them. Like sleeping in an uncomfortable position. Not your case, since I told you at the beginning to adopt a comfortable position. Or having a fever can be a factor or even eating before going to sleep, because this increases the body's metabolism and brain activity. Another proof that dreams are generated in the brain and cannot exist without a material substrate is the observation that people who have damage in a region of the brain, the parietal lobe, typically stop dreaming they may continue to live and sleep normally, including with paradoxical sleep phases, but no dreams take place. A theory in neurobiology based on this type of observations is that dreams are a reaction to activity inside and outside the body. There can be changes in temperature, however imperceptible they are, physical sensations, and these signals reach the brain, where the active regions try to create meaning from them, and this would result in dreaming, which in this case would be like an accident. Dreams would be a byproduct of brain activity, while the regions that would normally process these signals are inactive. But still, when we remember dreams, we are often able to recognize a lot of elements from them, taken from our lives, people, situations, places, emotions, fears, hopes. And this is why the idea that they are important to the study and the understanding of the human mind is as old as psychology, as a science. Some of the earliest and broadest theories about dreams 
were developed in the late 19th century by Sigmund Freud. Initially, Freud supposed that the content of dreams was driven by uh, unconscious wishes. In the architecture of the mind he described or theorized, our conscient selves are just one layer. The unconscious mind would exist under it or behind it and sometimes clash with the conscious mind or be exposed in certain situations when the conscious mind is asleep, like under hypnosis or during dreams. There was a time in the 20th century when Freudian theories, because they were well beyond the interpretation of dreams, were quite popular in the scientific community and beyond. But they have lost a lot of influence in the past few decades because of criticisms of his methods and uh, modern experimental studies that tend to disprove his theories. One central problem with Freud's theories, and more broadly the practice of psychoanalysis he started, is that they were never based on clinical studies on large samples of individuals. Freud elaborated his theories based on a small number of patients, and his followers did the same. When it comes to human sciences, you cannot create experiments where you control all the parameters, like physics or biology can, but still there is a scientific approach. You can prove phenomena by using statistics on large samples, be it in psychology or in sociology. In history, a theory can be defended with documents and facts, concrete elements. When it comes to Freud theories, there is nothing of this. They appear as an intellectual construction using concepts that may or may not describe an aspect of reality. But in any case, they are invisible and impossible to measure. A way to know that they exist and can be acted upon would be to prove that these concepts can find uh, applications in certain cures or practices and systematically produce effects. But this was never done on a large scale or a scale large enough to qualify as a scientific approach. This is one reason why Freud has fallen largely out of favor in the communities of psychologists and psychiatrists. His theories were a little bit at the intersection of science and literature, and they required that you accept his description of the mind without seeing any proof that it is anything else than an intellectual creation based on a few examples. But examples are anecdotes, not data. And in fact, many psychoanalysts along the 20th century have come up with different theories about dreams. To Carl Jung, a Swiss psychoanalyst, dreams were messages from the unconscious mind to help the dreamer resolve emotional problems. Another theory by Fritz Perls was that there are projections of parts of the dreamer's self that had been ignored, rejected or suppressed. All of this has the merit of offering different angles. It is intellectually stimulating, but like for Freud, the skeptics ask where are the proofs that this is anything more than the product of the author's imagination. Whether we choose to adopt or reject the theories of Freud and other psychoanalysts, Maybe the value in their work is more in the invitation to look beyond the obvious 
when it comes to the human mind. They introduced the idea, which is now widely accepted, that our will and the way our minds work are not necessarily the same thing. We have hidden impulses, repressed memories, emotions that are not rational and that may come from places we ignore. All of this was a hidden continent before Freud and some of his predecessors in the 19th century. They opened a window on the complexity of the human mind and they began looking for answers. So in that sense, modern psychology and psychiatry owe at least a debt of gratitude to Freud. Speaking of psychology, psychologists also are interested in dreams, but most of the time with a different angle, a different approach. It is not so much about what dreams mean or reveal, but more about why we dream, to what necessity they correspond, if any. Here again there are theories that are, in a sense, hard to prove, hard to experiment, but they also give a lot of food for thought. The first theory is that dreams are a useful tool to improve the mind's ability to meet human needs during wakefulness. This is based on the theory that we have mental patterns, mental patterns that help us solve problems and test what works and what doesn't in our awake life. Dreams would be a way for the mind to test new patterns, to better our mind in the sense that it would make it better adapted to survival and the satisfaction of our needs. To say the same differently, the dreams would help select efficient mental structural outlines to eventually rewire our minds or solidify best practices. There is the underlying idea that dreams would have a role to play in evolution. They would be an evolutionary feature that makes us better at surviving. Some psychologists have supposed that dreams evolved in our species and many others for threat simulation. Dreams would have evolved to replicate these threats and continually practice dealing with them. An element in favor of this approach is that based on large samples of dream reports, people say that their dreams comprise much more threatening events than we meet in real life. And most of the time, the dreamer engages with them either by escaping or facing them. So, according to this theory, dreams would allow for a rehearsal of threatening scenarios, be they about physical or emotional threats. They would help us anticipate and process. Yet another theory is that dreams are a mental gymnastics. They recombine elements in ways that would keep the processing of information in the brain flexible. They would breed creativity, and in that sense they would help us thrive as individuals and as a species. But there are also numerous psychologists who consider dreams to be probably just a byproduct of sleep physiology, like a residue of a system designed mainly to think and rest. There is a very broad research conducted on the content of dreams that took place at an university in Ohio from the 1940s to the 1980s. More than 50,000 dream reports were collected. Among the teachings from this wide sample 
It appears that visuals in dreams typically mix different locations, people and objects that the dreamer can recognize from his memories and experiences. But they blend into each other, and conversations often adopt a bizarre or exaggerated form. Another teaching is that people who are blind from birth do not have visual dreams, and the content of their dreams is related to other senses. Emotions are predominantly described as negative, the most common one being anxiety. Positive emotions like happiness also appear, and by definition this is based on what people say, what people remember. So it is possible that negative emotions are more memorable. Sexual themes are present but secondary. In average, they represent no more than 10% of the content, and they tend to decrease with age. Also, interestingly, a small minority declares that they only dream in black and white, and it seems this proportion was higher in previous generations, up to 25% for people who were only exposed to black and white film and television in their childhood. But long before attempts at understanding dreams by systematic studies or neurobiology, they had a major cultural and religious impact on human societies. Among those that left written records from ancient history are the Sumerians, the Assyrians, or the Egyptians. There were variations in beliefs, but they generally considered dreams to be messages from the gods, like oracles. They announced events to come or showed the correct way to dreamers. In India and China, dreams were more often seen as a journey of the soul out of the body during sleep. One aspect of the soul stayed in the material world, and another aspect of it was freed and could travel to the dream realm. But interestingly, in both of these two civilizations, there was also a questioning about the nature of dream, and in the first millennium BC, there were authors arguing that dreams were simply an expression of inner desires, which is exactly the dominant approach that prevailed in the West in the 19th century and 20th century, and that remains very popular with the public nowadays. The ancient Greeks and Romans also had this dual approach. They were influenced by other cultures and initially believed that dreams were messages from the gods that visited the sleepers. In later centuries, though, several authors argued that the visions that occurred in dreams were produced by thoughts, conversations, or concerns that people had during daytime. And they also had this hypothesis that the producers of dreams were humans themselves. In Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, there used to be this tradition that dreams were connected to the divine and provided messages or inspirations, and that bad dreams could be inspired by uh, the devil or demons. There are frequent stories of dreams that provided uh, divine inspiration in the Old Testament, for example. This emphasis on the meaning of dreams has faded away over time. In modern times, there are 
mit Schleser für ganz hören. Early on, dreams have also been a topic of interest for philosophers and it made them question the nature of what we consider to be the real world. Some of them concluded that what we call the real world or reality could be just an illusion. We all know about this hypothesis. It is the basis for the idea that we live in a simulation, like in the Matrix movies, for example. But the Matrix is just a modern iteration of an old idea. Its first recorded mention is from a Chinese text from the first millennium BC. It was also discussed in Hinduism, and the idea was introduced to Western philosophy by Descartes in the 17th century. Dreams used to be seen in the antiquity as neutral or positive because they could bring messages from the gods. But the Christian tradition evolved in the Middle Ages towards a more negative or harsher interpretation of dreams. They were increasingly seen as evil and inspired by the devil, which also passed to Protestantism at the beginning, at the time of the Reformation. This has to be put into context. In the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance, there were mounting concerns about the influence of evil or demons in the world and they were actively tracked. This is the period when witch hunts multiplied and religious inquisitions gained more influence. So by default, unexplained phenomenon or anything abnormal would be considered evil or strongly suspected. In parallel to the religious traditions, there was also a literary motif, a plot device that developed and uh, moved along the centuries to dream world, another world where the rules of reality are suspended. A character is placed in a marvelous and unpredictable environment. This is also an ancient device that appeared in the antiquity. It was also present in medieval tales and it found a wide popularity since the 19th century. When you think of Alice in Wonderland, Lovecraft, the never-ending story, there are plenty of examples in fantasy and other types of fiction. In popular culture today, Dreams are almost always depicted as expressions of the dreamer's desires and fears. This remains very inspired by the early theories by Freud. It is a bit unavoidable in fiction, because you describe or you show things only when they bring something to the story, when they matter. So when dreams appear, they have to be meaningful. They need to be some kind of message, some kind of prophecy, or they have to provide insight on a character. As we have seen along our story tonight, sleep is a different state of consciousness. In common language, we could say we are unconscious when we sleep. But it is not full unconsciousness, because we can still react to stimuli and quickly wake up. There are states of much deeper unconsciousness, like a coma, when people are unresponsive to external stimuli. Sleep is not that deep, which is why it is considered a state of altered consciousness. And to conclude, I'm going to tell you about two other states of consciousness related to sleep that are also on the consciousness spectrum. Somnambulism, sleepwalking, and lucid dreaming. 
Sleepwalking is a phenomenon that sounds paradoxical. It is sleep and wakefulness at the same time. It always occurs during slow wave sleep. You remember, in the various phases of the sleep cycle we talked about before, there is a state of quiescent sleep, not rapid eye movement sleep, during which we go through three different phases. And this is the last, the deepest one, before we turn to paradoxical sleep with rapid eye movement. The cause of sleepwalking is unknown. There could be genetic predispositions, the effect of one or several neurotransmitters, hormones, but the truth is these are just hypotheses. No probable cause has ever been identified. So, for some reason, a sleeper suddenly begins performing activities that are usually performed during a state of full consciousness. Most of the time, these are just simple activities like talking or sitting up in bed. But in some cases, it can be more complex tasks like going to the bathroom, cleaning or eating. Episodes have been recorded from 30 seconds to 30 minutes. In rare cases, it can be dangerous because their perception of the environment and their judgment is impaired. There has been studies about the prevalence of sleepwalking. It is uncommon but not extraordinary. 4 to 10% of people could have at least one episode in their lifetimes. And another study has found that it is more common in children than adults. Another surprising state of consciousness is lucid dreaming, which is the name of a type of dreams where dreamers become aware that they are dreaming, but the dream doesn't stop. This may give the dreamer some amount of control over the dream, and that puts him or her in a fragile or fleeting equilibrium because they can wake up at any time. But sometimes this state can last. The existence of lucid dreams has been documented since long ago. Early Buddhists cultivated this awareness and Greek philosophers talked about it. Scientific research about it started in the 20th century and it showed that lucid dreams could happen during REM sleep. Maybe again thanks to certain neurotransmitters that are present in higher quantity than usual. In that case, one called acetylcholine. Regions of the brain that are typically inactive when dreaming may be partially activated allowing the sleeper to gain awareness that it is a dream. But this is by nature hard to investigate, because it is all based on people's reports, and this is not an easy state to replicate for experiments. Other researchers have suggested that lucid dreaming may be not a state of sleep, but one of brief wakefulness, when people are on the edge between sleep and wakefulness and what they sincerely think is a dream would be the product of their imagination in this fleeting state at the very beginning of awakening. A lot more could be said about sleep and dreams, but we have reached the end of our journey for tonight. And now it is your turn to sleep, if you wish to, or if you don't, 
There are many more stories you can choose from in my library of recordings. I'll talk to you soon with another story. And in the meantime, sleep well. Sweet dreams.